Let us go to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Go to Luke 2, chapter 2, verse 8 to 14. God is worthy to receive glory. 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 Because glory comes from him and returns to him. So glory is in him. Um, and in the word was glory, as John 1, uh, 1, 1, 14 tells us. Uh, but also Isaiah 24, 16 um, shows us that gl the glory that comes from him returns to him surely. And to those who give him glory, he repays with peace, just as we read. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men, on whom God's favor rests. So the way he repays those who give him glory is with peace. So even though this concept of glory and peace may seem not so related, not so relevant, but they are, as you're going to hear today. So faith is longing for um, the God um, who is worthy to receive glory and welcoming the gift of peace that he offers, that he gives. Um, and once we have that faith, we live our life giving him glory. We give him glory passionately, enthusiastically. We give him glory willingly and overcome all things until receiving that eternal peace in his house. Amen. Yeah. So glory and peace um, almost sounds like it could be a title of a book, right? Like was it War and Peace? Peace, yeah, War and Peace. I don't, I don't know if you're into classics, but I remember reading it and watching also a movie on, on that, which is sort of like a romantic, you know, it's a, it's a, rom a romance novel, but, um, but very well written and very, very well um, told story. Um, but glory and peace, how do you think they are related? What's the one word that brings them together? Can you think? There's a concept that seems to be contrary, but that brings the two together, glory and peace. It will be war, war and peace. Do you understand, right? So glory and peace, and in between them would be war. Because for glory to be there, for, for one to have glory, let's say, there has to be victory. Right? Glory is something that a victor receives in, as, a, as a reward to his victory. And for victory to be uh, received... There has to be war. Right? Without war or battle, there is no victory. And without victory, there is no glory. When you think about peace, uh, peace, of course, um, can be defined um, in various ways. But, you know, it, it has that one common theme of in, it's the state of being in tranquility uh, or um, being freed from disturbance. So freedom from disturbance. And you could fill in or replace the concept of disturbance with many things, like war, like natural disasters, call it earthquakes, hurricanes, or wildfires, right? Or terrorism, um, or um, sickness, poverty. So freedom from such disturbance would be called peace. Uh, and then you bring that home on a micro level, on a very personal individual micro level, then it would be uh, freedom from oppressive thoughts, right? So you could have war uh, physically, vis visibly um, out on a front line as in a combat you know, field or setting, but one can be struggling with war in their minds, right? So that could be in the form of anxiety, uh, some kind of fear, oppressive fear, uh, or worries, and, and so on. So that they can be struggling with um, that kind of war, internal war. So peace would be having none of that, being set free from that. So for you to have peace, for one to have peace and enjoy it, there has to be then disaster or disturbance before that. Uh, and that disturbance is in the form of war. So war is sort of in between these two things, uh, glory and, and peace. And I kind of thought about like peace because I remember asking the same question in Sunday school a few days ago. And I said, when you guys think about peace, what do you think of? And I was kind of waiting for them to do this and surely they did it. They went like this, right? So <laughs> peace, even kids know what this is. And 
And I don't know, and many of you know that, right? When you take pictures, you do this. A lot of Asians, I think they do this. I don't know why. I know why. Because there's a political history behind all this. If you know what this means, what does it mean? It's victory. But then when they say peace, they do this. You ever think about that, right? So you say this means victory. So soldiers do this, troops, like in, during the, uh, like the World War II times, I believe. And then, you know, the soldiers who came to Korea or in Vietnam or even Japan, you know, they, they sort of like internalize this concept of victory. So I don't know what that's got to do with pictures, but instead of cheese, they would do this. <laughs> so photobomb someone, you do this. Yeah, then, so why that? And then peace. The hippies went peace, right? So it's victory, but then you say peace doesn't really go together, but it's because they do go together, glory and peace. Uh, to have peace, you have to have um, uh, war that has to be won first, right? And victory is what leads you to peace. Victory is what, you, what leads you to glory. And for victory to be received, yes, there has to be war. Um, so even though... Um, no one wants a war. No one wants destruction. No one wants to even think about. Um, so the reason why war is hated and, and not, not liked, it's because war destroys. Right? War destroys, destroys lives, um, causing casualties, but also destroys properties. Um, so the, the, the buildings get demolished, cities get ruined. Um, so destruction is all, on all levels. So war is to be avoided at all cost. However, throughout the history of mankind, there was not really a period without war ever. There were always wars, small to big scale. So even in this country that has never been, uh, you know, never, besides the Civil War, never actually experienced war within the boundaries. Now, with terrorism, um, since the 9-11 attacks, um, we feel like as Americans, as together living here uh, at war, like this sense of fear and uncertainty under attack. Of course, we still go about our days, and it's not like being in war zones in the Middle East or even some parts of Africa or in other parts of the world where there are ethnic conflicts and tribal or um, you know, other types of uh, conflicts. Um, still, now that we live in this sort of this thing called global terrorism, we don't know where we're going to get hit or how we're going to get hurt and so on. So there is this heightened sense of anxiety of the unknown uh, because of the times that we live in. So why is this so important about having victory and therefore get, uh, receiving glory and peace? Because God is the God who is of glory, who is worthy to receive glory, and because glory is in God alone. Glory is in God alone. Proverbs chapter 21 verse 31 says, victory rests in God alone. So the only one who can actually do this is God alone. Amen? Yes. So um, the war. Um, yes, war is what we find in the Bible. Perhaps some of you came like, this is Christmas. I thought it's about Prince of Peace. But for us to talk about peace, we have to talk about war. We always have to start with you know, the attribute of God that seems kind of contrary to what we want to talk about, but to see how that attribute of God is fulfilled. All right? So for men to finally know God as the God who's worthy to receive glory and to work for his glory and to fight for his glory and to give him glory, God made man to be spiritual beings, not just physical beings that lives a day and then dies next. But he made us to be spiritual beings, to live with God, live like God forever. For to do that, for him to do that, our ancestor Adam was made in a living being, and from him came all of us, having inherited not just the flesh, but the spirit inside. This uh, living being has to live by the word of God, and that is spirit. The spirit lives by the spirit food, which is called the word of God in the form of command. But he, in the Garden of Eden, lost the first battle in the human history against the devil. Because the serpent, uh, a serpent was in the garden who used the word of God and twisted around and tempted the woman, and through the woman, the man was uh, deceived. To, to become like God, to be like God, and challenge the word of God by taking the forbidden fruit. Instead of becoming like God, of course, 
uh, man became cut off from God as a result of sin. So what he did when he ate the fruit was he committed sin. And sin entered the spirit, and the price of sin came to the spirit, which was, which was death. But spiritually, this is described as being slaves of the devil. Second Peter chapter 2.19 says that. So if you lose your war, right, you become captives of your enemy. Right, so you 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 can imagine, right, in a, like a battle scene in the in the in the old times and the history, when uh, one uh, country dominates the other, one tribe dominates the other, they take the captives. They take the captives, whether it's the young, the women, uh, uh, to be taken for their men or s as slaves, or to even fight for their own uh, and own own group. So they're taken as captives. And what the Bible says is spiritually, all men became captives of the devil as a result of sin. But men did not know that. Men did not know that they became defeated. Um, and because of being defeated, all men became destined to live in toil, in shame, and suffering. As God said to Adam, you will eat by the sweat of brow. But instead of reaping fruit, you will have thorns and thistles come out from the ground, and all your work will be in vain. And the woman will give birth in pain. There will be uh, pains to childbearing and so on. So we see God cursing uh, the man and the woman as a result of their sin. But there is something else that God says. So let's go to Gen Genesis 3.15, which, which was God's declaration of, the, uh, of an upcoming battle. And I will put enmity. So this is God speaking to the serpent, right? So in the previous passage, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And God continues, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Who's going to crush whose head? All right. So the offspring of the woman will crush the offspring of the serpent in the head while your offspring, the offspring of the serpent, will crush the heel, very good, of the offspring of the woman. So you see that one is a deadly blow and the other one is not. So there is this uh, foretelling of an upcoming showdown between two offsprings. Right? There's the offspring of the woman and the offspring of the serpent. If you fast forward that, it is referring to who? The son of God coming through the woman and the devil. Dun, 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 coming near you, in theaters near you. Thousands of years later on will be the greatest showdown ever in the history of the universe between the devil and the Son of God. Yes, that is foretold in Genesis 3.15. But of course, men did not know that, and even to this day, many people do not know about that. So for men to know about God and God's plan, God called on the people of Israel later on, and they become the chosen people of God. And their history becomes a history of wars. Numbers chapter 21 verse 14 says this is the book of wars. So the people of Israel who are chosen as the people of God, who are to serve God and glorify God, they were chosen to fight, if you will, because their history is a history of war. So that means they have to engage in warfare. And the interesting thing about their warfares, however, is that starting with the Exodus, the Red Sea, and their battles in the desert, and even in the Promised Land after they conquer it, we see God saying in Genesis 14, 13 to 14, Moses speaking on behalf of God, says, Do not be afraid. Stand, stand firm, and you will see the deliverance of the Lord that he will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Who's going to fight for you? The Lord. So it's like the, the father who are on the soccer field, you know, sideline, and the kids get into some kind of brawl, and then they're like, I'm getting in, and then they start duking out with the kids, sort of, right? So it's like if you're mature, you stand behind, and you don't get involved. But here's God saying, I'm going to fight for you. You just stand there and watch. Because they were chosen, the chosen people of God. And God said, I will fight for you. I am the God of glory. I am worthy to receive glory. Therefore, I will fight for my own glory, for my own victory. So this became the history of Israel. Uh, and God reminded them constantly that 
They will not have to fight the battle. Second Chronicles chapter 20, 17. And stand firm. See the deliverance the Lord will give you. In 1 Samuel 17, 47, uh, the Lord said, the battle is the Lord's. Whose battle? The Lord's. The battle is the Lord's. All together. Yes. So even though we understand God to be the God of peace, God of glory, but you have to understand what that means. Glory only has a meaning after a battle and victory is won. So uh, the battle has been won. So he fights his own battle, and the people of Israel witness that. So even if the odds were against them, they didn't have the tools, they didn't have the weaponry, they didn't have chariots or horses, but the Egyptians were destroyed before their eyes. Uh, so many other, uh, whether they were Assyrians or Arameans, the armies around them, and at the time, their king led them to praise in the middle of battle. Praise. You know, praise, like with the drums and trumpets. And then what happened after they were done with King Jehoshaphat? They had all, all the enemies surrounding them after singing songs and praising God, hallelujah, hallelujah, God reigns, hallelujah, and then they opened their eyes, and what happened? All their enemies fell around them because God took care of them, and they took care of each other, as in they killed each other off, hallelujah, mm, yes, <laughs> killed each other off, and we're going hallelujah, yes, because God is worthy to receive glory, and receives it, through his victory, and gives peace to men. Hallelujah. So you would think then the people of Israel would have a taste, have tasted peace and enjoy the peace that God gives as a result of his victory and glory. However, because of their history, involved constant warfare. And yes, when God was on their side, they won. But did they always win? Hello, did they always win? What do you think? No, why not? Because... God became weak. I'm tired of fighting for you guys. I've been beaten now. Why not? Why did they lose battles? Because they did lose many times. And they were taken uh, captives, and they exiled other countries as well. They were taken in, in horrendous ways. You know, when you see, when you read about the final destruction of Jerusalem, uh, when their king was taken, um, they were, uh, the king of Israel was gouged out of his eyes and his children were killed right before him uh, and chained and dragged to Babylonia. So it was horrible ways of losing when in their history had many times like that. The reason was they sinned against God. When they did not obey God, when they did not honor God, when they did not glorify God, instead worship other gods and they went astray from the word of God and did not obey him, then they lost horribly. So they long for peace, naturally, and they cling, uh, clung unto the prophecy about the coming peace. As the sanctuary, first in the tabernacle form and later on the temple of Jerusalem, reminded them. Jerusalem being Yerushalayim, Yerushalayim which means uh, the heritage or the place of peace, they understood that from there would flow peace because the name of the Lord God was in the temple. What was the name that they knew in the Old Testament? Jehovah or Yahweh, it was the name of the Lord God who was glorious, who gives them peace when they give him glory. So they waited and longed for him, and there was prophecy. Psalm 24, verses 7 to 10, it says, Lift up your heads, you gates, you be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates, lift them up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is he, this king of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the king of glory. Who was the prophecy about? Yes, we, we believe that today as believers of Yeshua. That was the prophecy about him. But to the Jews, they, had, they did not know, but they understood that the, this king was coming and that this king would be mighty in battle, mighty in battle. So they were envisioning like a man like David, right? David, even though he was small in stature and young and experienced as a fighter, but he knocked down the giant Goliath, the uncircumcised beast. So they, they understood that a hero like that would be risen up among them. So they waited for this king, that this king would be mighty in battle. He would walk through the gates that are open. So when you think about open up your gates, open up your gates, you're thinking like open up gates, open the door. What do gates mean? Gates are like the opening of the city. You know, like the city itself, they had fortresses with gates at, at the entrance, that, you know, fortresses or castles. So they would open up, and that would be almost like a triumphal um, arch, you know that, right? Like the one in Paris, the one, 
if you didn't go to anywhere else but in Manhattan, you know, Washington Square also has one too. Uh, or uh, the Roman, this, they say that the ancient Romans started doing this, the two large pillars connecting by this arch thing, and usually there's some kind of inscription, and it's to mark their victory. So there's like, there's an arc of um, uh, Titus, after Titus destroyed Jerusalem. So there is like a uh, depiction of um, them de destroying the temple of Jerusalem. So you can imagine the Jews getting so upset about this, but the Romans celebrate this moment, so they built an ark. So uh, uh, the triumphal arch would be where the fighter, the, ar the generals, will march. You can imagine, right? Bum, 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 and all the people bowing down and coming in, receiving all that glory as bringing the victory for their king. So it was that kind of uh, picture or image that they had uh, as, as the people of Israel waiting for this prophecy to be fulfilled. And as we read in Isaiah 9, 6, the word said, for us a child is born, to us a son is given, the government will be on his shoulders. What will be on his shoulders? Government. What does the government mean? Government. What is the government? Government means authority. This is about royalty, the, uh, the lordship over the people. So he would be reigning over people. He will be their king. And he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Hallelujah. And finally, let's go to Matthew 1.21. Matthew 1.21. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So in English, it says Jesus, and you're saying, well, it used to be like, you know, Church of Jesus, like they're like speaking in tongues, so they, they're really strange people. There's no cross in the building. They're really strange people. And they're like screaming, like casting out, get out, get out. They are really, really strange people. And then add on to that, this thing, Yeshua, they are really strange people. So it's another reason to feel really foreign when you come here, even as you might have been exposed to Christian, you know, being around Christians or uh, in being in the Christian faith. But Yeshua is the original name for Jesus, and it comes from here. It says, because he will save his people from their sins. The name Yeshua has that meaning. Jesus doesn't because it's an anglicized form of the name Jesus, uh, Yeshua, and then later uh, Yesu in Greek and Latin. But Yeshua is the name that was to be given to the baby born of a virgin. So this word was according to Isaiah 7.14. So Isaiah 7.14 says, The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they are to call him. You are to call him Emmanuel. So in the name Yeshua, all these meanings were Wonderful Counselor, say it with me. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Emmanuel, Yeshua, hallelujah. Yes, so the king would come with this name. Because remember, in Hebrew concept, or, or the name Yeshua is Aramaic name, but the meaning tells you their destiny, like who they are. Right? So all their names, they live up to that name. So the one coming in the name of Savior, Salvation, will save his people from their sins. And that's how he was going to win the battle, have victory, and give peace to men and glory to God. Hallelujah! So according to that prophecy, a virgin who had taken the word as her providence, that she was going to conceive a child while she was virgin. Yes, we must believe in the virginal conception of Jesus Christ, meaning that she did not... Uh, conceive the baby as a result of having something, something with Mr. Something, something, or someone, someone out there. It's not. But the, when she said, be unto me according to your word, as the angels say, you will have a child, the word fell on her body. The word. The word as a seed falling onto her body as a field, and the word became then flesh. What is this word? John 1.1. 1, 1. Quickly, go to John 1.1. 1, 1. The word. As First uh, Peter chapter 1 describes as the imperishable seed enduring and living word of God. This is the same word. Chapter 1, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. Who is God again? God is worthy to receive glory. And he is worthy to receive glory, not just today, but he always was worthy to receive glory. He is, to, he is worthy to receive glory. He will always be worthy to be receiving glory. Hallelujah. 
And that God, that word was God. That word was from the beginning. Do you understand? Baby, the baby was born 2,000 years ago in a very, very humble, humble, humble beginning, right? As you've seen, many of you, even if you don't come from Christian background, everyone knows when I meet them, and many of you I met a year ago or months ago. Have you ever been to church? No. Have you ever heard about Jesus? Yes. About what? Christmas, you know, and the nativity scene. Okay, all right, we have something to work with. So people know about, you know, Mary holding the baby and then the shepherds and the sheep. There's always sheep there, sheep and, and, and Joseph in the back, you know, hovering over the baby and the mom. And, you know, sometimes it, if they have a fancy version of the nativity scene, there's a wise man with the gifts, you know, it's a kind of gross and more animals. So people think of Jesus in that scenario, the baby. Yes, he was born a baby just like us. But who is he? The Bible tells us through the Holy Spirit we believe, according to the word, that he was the word in the beginning. In the beginning. That beginning was before time. Before the world was made. Before any of us came to the world. Any of us came to existence. Before there was man. There, before there was angels. Before there was sin. There was the word with God in the beginning. As, the, as God was worthy to receive glory, the word was worthy to receive glory. Do you understand? Like the, the, in the banner, the stars, the word which was in the beginning. The word who is holy, who is perfect, who is mighty, who always was in the beginning became flesh just like the star you know the shooting star they're going that is going by in the sky in the night sky the word came to the body of the virgin named mary when she said amen to the word and said even if it means that they're going to stone me to death as they find out that i'm pregnant and giving birth to a child as an unmarried woman i will carry out this providence and said amen and the word fell on her like the shooting star coming down the word from the beginning fell on her body and nine months later here she is betrothed to joseph not even married yet Betrothed was a custom that they had, which was engagement type. And before marriage, they would live with the in-laws, but not sleeping with, the, with her fiancé. So she's living in the ho home, and she was uh, pregnant. Now, Joseph, being a gentle man, he was going to quietly divorce her. But an angel came to him and told him about Jesus. So then he embraced her and embraced this baby that she was going to give birth to. At the time they were taking census, they had to go back to their birthplace. And because Joseph was coming, Joseph came from the line of David, had to go to Bethlehem to register. Like, so it's for census reasons. So he, they travel. And because it was, everyone had to do this, the whole place was packed with travelers. And she was about to give birth. Probably her water broke and she was in pain. And she had to give birth. The baby was about to come. And they didn't have a place to go to. So they found an animal barn. And she gave birth. And the baby came out. And baby, the baby was laid in a manger where animals eat. And was swaddled in cloth and lay there. You know, I thought about it as, and, and, and this morning too. It's just... My heart started breaking, not because like, oh, poor Jesus, you didn't even have a royal bed. You know, it's like the, the prince and princess in Great Britain, they have better beds than you. <laughs> they have, you know, they have, they had nicer place to give birth, being given birth to. It's not that. It's that he is God. The word from the beginning, from him came all things. From whom comes glory, to whom glory must return. But without People knowing he came quietly, silently to a world that would not welcome him. And why did he come? It was for the glory, God, glory of God, to give glory to God in heaven and peace on earth to men. Hallelujah! So he came according to the prophecy. 
even though he did not look anything like someone who has government on his shoulders, he did not look anyone that anyone like that, that they had imagined coming from a royal lineage and that he was going to be strong and mighty and powerful. Instead, he came to a poor carpenter's family. And Joseph, there is a trace of him as Jesus comes of age, but that there's no mention of him, meaning he died early on when Yeshua was still young. So basically, he grows up as a single mom, with single mom, you know, single parent household with many other siblings coming after him. He lives a quiet, humble life until he's baptized by John the Baptist. And when he comes out of water, there's a declaration from heaven saying, this is my beloved son. With him, I am well pleased. Hallelujah. So even though he lived his life as a son of Mary and, and perhaps Joseph to the world, to the neighbors and the people around him, here's a voice from heaven saying, this is my son, and I am so pleased with him, and I love him. From that moment on, he began to do the work of the kingdom of heaven. In fact, before he was baptized, John the Baptist, same John who baptized Jesus in the previous chapter, Matthew 3, he proclaimed, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. What did he say? Just those words sound like words of war decoration, doesn't it? Like, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Bum, 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 bum. Da, 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 da. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. So you're hearing the march of invasion, invasion. Somebody's invading, coming, coming, coming. But certainly when a country is invaded, they don't come with a loud trumpet procession. They come like very, very quiet, like snow in the middle of the night. That's how Koreans still tell the story about the Korean War. Sunday morning, very hot day, June 25th, 1950, the North Koreans, the communists invaded South Korea and people were just ambushed because nobody expected them, them to come. I remember this hearing ever since I was a child. Like this is how it happened. I think all the Koreans growing up, they heard that. So war happens like this. It sneaks up on you. But John the Baptist had said, repent. Those of you who have the ears to hear, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. You are to hear an army of heaven marching and coming, kicking dust, coming to the world to destroy the prince of the world. Who is the prince of the world? The devil. The devil who is the enemy of God who betrayed God in heaven. Even though he was made to glorify God as an angel, as Isaiah 14, 12 to 15 says, he said, I want to be like God. I want God's glory. I'm going to steal and make it mine from the throne of God. When he challenged God, God did not fight him, but God threw him out of the spiritual heaven and contained him in Hades, that is the universe, darkness, the pit. That is where we live. This is where the angel was contained. He was called Satan, which means the enemy, the rebel of God. And when man was made, he is called the devil. Do you know what devil means in Greek? First of all, it's called ho diabolos. And ho diabolos means someone who separates to do what? Destroy. Separates to destroy. Yes, he's a destroyer. That's how he came in between Adam and God, meaning all mankind and God as a serpent. And that's what he still does today. He comes between men and he comes to tempt us as well with our minds so that we are separated from the spiritual. So this was, to, this was the enemy of God that he had come to destroy, the prince of the world. He was given the authority to rule of the world with the power of death but un it would be only until Jesus, Yeshua, would destroy him at the cross. So he had a mission. Yeshua had a mission to destroy him. So that's when he looked at the temple. He said, destroy it, and I will raise it again in three days. Speaking of his own death and his resurrection, he was saying, I'm going to fight to death, and I am going to surely overcome and triumph this warfare and give glory to God and release all of you who are held as captives, prisoners under the devil. Hallelujah! So that's why when men wanted to make him king, because when they saw Jesus performing miracles and speaking and preaching, they thought, yes, there were many who thought, perhaps this is the Messiah who was prof prophesied to come. Perhaps he will lead us to restoration of our kingdom. 
but he refused their attention. He rejected their invitation and even escaped death at a time when they, the Jews were so angry, wanted to kill him because he knew that his death would come only at the cross when it was time. So when men came to arrest him, he did not refuse or resist, but he went to the cross willingly. And when he died, what did he say? He said, it is finished. Hallelujah. So he finished the will of God the Father at the cross and gave glory to the Father. So the moment he died was the moment he was achieving the will of God, obeying the will of God, obeying the command of God, as he said in John 10, 17, 18. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I receive from my father. So to the point of laying down his life to death, to the point of death, he obeyed, he submitted, he used his body as the battlefield. He used his body also as a weapon. To destroy the power of death, he became the weapon of death. Not to kill others, but by laying down his life, he will go one against one. With his power, his authority to lay down his life, to die, he would destroy the one who has the power to kill. That is the power of the devil. Hallelujah. And by doing so, he would destroy the enemy. Because he had two types of authorities, right? The authority to lay down his life and the authority to take it up again. The devil had no idea. The devil was like a wasp with sting. Only one. When you use it, you die. And he thought, if I kill him and even if I die, that's okay. If I, even if it's over, it's all right. Get rid of him. And he thought he did. But he had no idea there was another authority that Yeshua had in him. And that was to take up his life, to resurrect to life. Because in three days, Yeshua rose from the grave. And he overcame the grave, overcame the devil, overcame death. Hallelujah. Hebrews 12, 2 says, For the joy set before him, Yeshua endured the cross, scorning its shame. And after resurrecting, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So when he willingly chose death and used his body, enduring the pain, the shame, the suffering, there was joy set before him. There was peace set before him. There was glory set before him, according to the Father's promise. Amen. So he used his body's weapon to destroy this enemy. And in turn, what happened was that he released us from the hands of the enemy. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Now do you understand? We were held under the fear of death. We were held under the devil, fearing death, which is the greatest, most powerful weapon, death. Sure, we're afraid of guns and bombs and whatever. It's because of death. And the reason why men fear death, it's because of sin in them. Who caused sin? It was the devil, and the devil holds that against all men. All men were held in slavery under the devil until this moment. And Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 to 9 describes it as the war. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the great dragon, the ancient serpent, the devil. And the serpent could not win. The, the dragon could not win, all referring to the devil, and was hurled down to the earth as a result. So this moment is the moment of the victory of Yeshua at the cross. Even though he seemed like he lost his battle and died on the cross in three days, he rose from the grave. The countdown began. Ten. You know we're going to do this in a week, right? Ten. Nine, eight, seven, five, four, three, two, one. Bum, 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 bum. Yeshua won the battle. He won the war. He won the grave. Hallelujah. Woo! He became the king of glory. And he was taken up to heaven. Sat down at the right hand of God. The right hand of the majesty. The right hand does not mean there's somebody on the left. Right hand means the throne of God, as Revelation 22 also talks about the throne of God and of the Lamb. There's only one throne in heaven, and there's only one seated on that throne that is the Son of Man with the name Yeshua, the King of glory, who is worthy to receive glory forever and ever. Hallelujah! From there, he sent the Holy Spirit 
to those who have received the precious blood he shed from the cross, who, who receive and welcome the blood of Yeshua as life for the life that they receive in their souls, and they believe that they have been set free from the, from the bondage under the devil. As Isaiah 61 says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness, or in ESV, it says the, the opening of the prison to those who are bound. So the good news has come to those who have been bound in the prison. And many people are like, I've never been in prison. I've never gone to prison. I've never been bound. Yes, we have all been bound under the devil because of sin and death. But Yeshua, he nailed the chains to the cross, nailed sin to the cross, nailed death to the cross, nailed the power of devil to the cross. So we have been set free. The prison doors have been opened. Hallelujah. How do we know this? The Holy Spirit coming in the name of Yeshua proclaims this good news to this day. So those who welcome the name Yeshua as the name of the glorious king, say amen if this is you. Amen. That means you have received the blood of Yeshua, the glorious name, the glorious blood of Yeshua into your soul. And the result is you receive peace. Amen. Because the battle has been won. The king of glory shed his precious blood, his life for you and me. When we receive that, we experience peace. We experience peace, freedom. So many people give um, uh, testimonies about being free from diseases, whether it's physical or mental, from anxieties, from worries, or even depression. Because... The state of tranquility that was absent as a result of the devil of because of sin, now with Yeshua coming as the king through the Holy Spirit in the name of Yeshua into my soul, and I say, amen, reign over me. You are my king, worthy to receive glory. I bow down before you. That is when my soul finds peace, and what is well with, with, with my soul, then it is well with my mind, it is well with my body. Hallelujah. Then, then the Holy Spirit helps such believers to fight the remaining battle. Fight the remaining battle. So, the, so our Lord Yeshua fought the greatest battle against the prince of the world. The devil, the one who holds the power of death, the one who wielded over men with the power of sin and death. He took care of him. However, the devil is still around. He's not in the fire yet because the fire is not burning yet. Because the fire will be burned here right now where we live. Aquí. Estamos aquí. Yes? Yeah, right here. So this is where the fire will burn. Until then, the devil is still roaming around. But he's like a wasp without sting, so he has no weapon. But he's got one thing left. That's called his tongue. He lies. He leads the world astray. So he deceived men to think that he still has power. And boy, does he have a lot of following. Yes, he has a lot of following, a lot of followers. Called the unbelieving world after they die, saying as unclean spirits, demons, and deceiving spirits, and evil spirits. Angels, there are many of them. So with them, we still have to fight. So why is it that if God is loving and peaceful and compassionate and merciful, why does he make us fight? Does he love to fight? No, we already covered the fact that why the reason for fight, the reason for war is for glory, for victory and for glory and peace. So he wants us to earn our crown. Because only those who bring their splendors, Revelation talks about that, only those who bring their own splendor, meaning glory, will enter the holy city, the new Jerusalem in heaven. So only those who have won their own battle can enter. Losers not, need not apply. Do you understand? Need not apply, you know, in, in, job inquiry, hiring, but underneath is this losers not wanted. Yes? Losers not wanted. Only the winners. And this winner is the winner from, winner from spiritual battle that they engage in while they are on earth, while we are on earth. So while we're on earth, we are still given fights. Yes. So in, after being a Christian, what happens? When a child becomes a Christian, when a husband becomes a Christian, and the rest of the family remains non-Christian, non-believer, 
They go home after going to Zoe, hallelujah, oh my God, the, everything is rosy and peachy. I feel like I'm walking in the park and everyone's angelic and I'm so happy. You walk in and you would think that everyone's like, oh, angels singing and la, la, la. What, what is it? What did, what's his name say? The gumdrops, rainbows, you know, unicorn flying. You would think that would happen, but what happens? Where were you? Past four days, five days, I've not seen you. Where have you been? You're always going to that. What church? What Christian? What Jesus? What are you talking about? Are you crazy? Are you, are, are you out of your mind? Instead of being welcome, the family's not up in, up in arms against the believer. Why, why is that? I thought God was going to give me peace. And I thought I was going to receive peace in home too. Because God is giving us chance to fight the battle that is my own so that I may win the crown that is my own, my own glory, my own peace. Hallelujah. So when that comes, I'm not encouraging you, and don't quote me for this, <laughs> that, that you're going to go home and be like, oh, yeah, mama, let's do it. Let's duke it out. I'm not encouraging you. Don't tell your mom that I told you to do that because I didn't. I didn't. Instead of being discouraged, however, this is what I'm going to say, be encouraged. Do not fear. Trust in God. Trust also in Yeshua, for he has already overcome the world. Hallelujah. With him on our side. With him as our leader, our commander-in-chief. He's already walked in. Bum, 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 bum. He's already went in. Went in the, through the triumphal arch in heaven, and I'm just going to follow him. But I got to have my own reason, too. I got to have my own reason to enter and follow him. He's already gone before him. He's won the battle. So that's why leadership is so important. And our leader, his name is Yeshua. He's the king of glory. Hallelujah. He is the prince of peace who reigns forever and ever in heaven. And he says, I have overcome the world. Now I give you my name. In my name, you will overcome by my blood, the blood of the lamb. You shall overcome. Hallelujah. So the Christian understands that following Christ as their leader, he fights or they fight their own fight and overcome. How do we overcome? What's the guarantee for overcoming our battle? It begins with the determination to fight to death. Yes, to fight to death. And if someone is determined to fight to death, they are not afraid of anything. If they're determined to fight to death, I'm going to the battlefield and I'm going to die. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to either win or I'm going to die or I'm going to die to win. Even if it means death, I'm going to win. There's nothing that can stop such a fighter, such a soldier of Christ. Amen? But if there is a condition, it's like, hold on, wait a minute. I did not sign up for this. I need to back off a little bit and rethink this. Then there is good chance they're going to lose. Yes. Because if you hold back, if you're sparing and holding back that way, then there is a chance. Actually, that person will fail. So the Christian who understands that he must fight and resist to death and finally overcome to receive the glory and the peace in store for him through Christ, as Christ himself received, he is determined to fight to death and he breaks whatever obstacle that may be before him breaking through the obstacle, destroying the obstacle before him. So what can that obstacle be? It could be the temptation that we struggle with, the sin that we struggle with. It could be the hardship that one, must be going th one might be going through, either financial or health or family, S and, or even persecution. Coming through the devil, the deceiving spirits and demons. The world comes at us with temptations. But the, the, the Lord reminds us, the Holy Spirit reminds us, do not love the world. For you do not belong to the world. You must not love the world. You belong to Christ. And if the world hates you, rejoice. Because you belong to the Lord. Amen? Amen. And the world, yes, your family is your world. If your family is not in the same faith, they're in the world. So when you say, well, I love the family and I need to show my love to them. Yes, it can be a means to sharing the faith and to save them. But if it compromises one's faith, then one has already lost the battle. So what this means is that you must be willing to use your life. We must be willing to use our bodies as our own weapon. 
Again, I'm not saying like in a suicide bomber setting to destroy other people, but it is to destroy, surrender ourselves. As Yeshua said, lay down your life. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. So the cross representing self-denial. Do you want to win? The way to win is to die. Because that was the strategy of God. Even though the world may call it the foolishness of God, the foolishness of God is the wisdom that is greater than any other wisdom of men. The weakness of God is stronger than any strength of any man in the world. Willingly he became weak, willingly he became foolish to the point of death. But that was his secret weapon to overcome. Hallelujah. So he had to set us the model to overcome, to lay down ourselves. But the world will say, oh, just one more time, spend time with your family. One more time, just do this and that. Meanwhile, you've already lost your battle. The enemy has already overcome, defeated you. And you have no, no strength to take the next step. And it's like trying to get out of a swamp. It gets deeper and more entangled and tangled. No strength and no power to overcome the next time. So we got to take a step at a time, determined to die, fighting. Not harming others, but fighting against ourselves. Resisting to the point of shedding blood. Resisting, overcoming shame. Overcoming fleshly desires, our lust, our worldly ambitions. And overcoming even suffering. When we are determined to do so, nothing can stop us. Because we have peace in the name Yeshua. And those who have peace in their spirit, nothing can overcome them. For they are victors. They are conquerors. Hallelujah. As the word reminds us in Romans 8, it says, Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sore overcome what can separate us from the love of Christ nothing can separate us from the love of Christ from the peace of God hallelujah so when we are obeying him and preaching we are using our body our lives as weapon to go and bring life to them while suicide bombers and terrorists are terrorizing people using their bodies as weapons to kill and destroy the people because they're enemies of the devil we are using our bodies, even if it means that we lose our face, we are embarrassed, even sped on. We use it to lay ourselves down, to win souls for Christ. We pray, we serve, we dedicate ourselves, we edify the body of Christ as members of the body. We do not hold our bodies back. We do not hold our lives back. We do not hold back our time, our treasure, and talent for the world and say, I'm too good for church. So we say, well, why don't you come and participate and do, no, I'm too busy. I have to, I have to work on my career. I have uh, something to prepare for a job. What they're saying is, I'm too good. I'm too good for that job. I'm too good. I'm too special to drive a van. I'm too good to babysit. I'm too good to teach kids. I'm too important. I'm more important than that. These are people who are holding themselves back for their, the world, for their families perhaps, for their future, for their ego. It is not what a fighter for the glory of God would do. For a fighter, a soldier of Christ says, my life now belongs to Christ. And just as my, my, my victorious, glorious commander-in-chief laid down his life as, as his greatest strategy, I'm going to lay down my life and become nothing to the point of death. Whatever you say, I will obey for the glory of the name Yeshua. Hallelujah. It is not to fear, not to hold back, but to surrender. And when we do, he will give us peace in this life. And finally, in that day, the gates of heaven be open for such believers. And the procession of angels and the elders we will see. And we will march into, through the gates, the triumphal gates of the kingdom of heaven. And reign with him as kings we're on the thrones in heaven. Hallelujah! Let us pray. If you have experienced the peace that Yeshua gave you as you have been set free from experience of anxiety, sadness, worries. Imagine what eternal peace is going to be like. 
where the river of peace flows endlessly. How is that possible? Because the limitless God became limited. Do you understand? The infinite God became finite, born a baby 2,000 years ago to a world that did not welcome him, for they did not recognize him. And to this day, the majority of the world does not want him. But he is the word from the beginning. He is God, the God who is worthy to be praised, worthy to receive glory forever and ever. Had he not come, what would have become of me? I would be left without hope because I would be going to hell with my own sin and no one would be able to save me and in hell to suffer forever in fear and pain. But because he came and overcame this, the, the devil, sin and death and the grave, I have become alive I have been set free not given a chance to fight my own battle let's lift up our hands and surrender to our victor our victorious king Yeshua Yeshua I welcome you as my king Yeshua, Yeshua! whatever obstacle you may be facing right now Know that your commander-in-chief, your leader has already gone through, broke through the greatest obstacle, the obstacle that is put before you. He knows, he trusts that you will break through and overcome. So do not fear. The way to break through, however, is to surrender yourself. Lay yourself 